Thank you for joining us today for Unraveling Neurodevelopmental and Behavioral Disorders. I'm really thrilled to have Dr. Steve Tullius here, um, streaming live from, you're in San Diego, right? San Diego, California? Correct, good. So um, Dr. Steve is a pediatric and family chiropractor specializing in the care of individuals with neurodevelopment, neurodevelopmental and behavioral conditions. He has a child with special needs and he learned through this process to thoroughly understand the gamut of healthcare related challenges that families go through as well as personal and familial challenges as well. Through the use of advanced nervous system examination technology to assess the health of the nervous system, as well as manual methods to restore balance to that system, Dr. Tullius is able to see extraordinary improvements in the quality of life of those he serves. Thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to this presentation today. All right, thank you so much, Nancy. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. All right, so thank you again very much, and thank you everyone who's on the uh, webinar here. I, uh, as Nancy mentioned, I am a pediatric family chiropractor. I, I travel and speak um, internationally on chiropractic and particularly on this topic. Um, as she mentioned, my, my focus is on autism, um, other neurodevelopmental issues, ADHD, uh, as, as, you know, sensory processing disorders, uh, epilepsy. We see lots of people with seizures in my practice. And uh, the reason I focused in on those particular issues is one, um, if we can impact the health of a child that early on in life, we can transform um, their future and uh, the future of that family. And uh, the reason that we see such um, uh, fantastic changes in health and quality of life and function really comes down to our philosophy. You know, the philosophy of chiropractic and in particular my office is one of salutogenesis, which comes from the Latin for saluto, uh, salute for health and genesis, the creation of. So really it's an approach focusing on, on what it means to be healthy, how to create uh, health and well-being rather than the traditional, or I should not traditional, but the mainstream model, uh, which is that of focusing on symptoms and disease. And uh, you know, in our office, we don't, we don't diagnose children with ADHD, with autism, with all these things. I see children and, and individuals as, as whole. I see that I see and believe that our natural state is one of optimal health and well-being. And when I give these talks live and ask people that question, I ask them, how many of you believe that the body is designed to be healthy and not sick? The, the, every hand goes up. You know, we all have this innate awareness that our body is designed to be healthy. So so it makes sense if we find ourselves or our children experiencing less than optimal health and function that there must have been some cause. There must have been some cause that took them from optimal health and well-being to a state where they're now uh, no longer experiencing that. So, and that will make a whole lot more sense as we're going through the presentation. I like to start my, my workshops, my presentations with this uh, story of Fatima. Fatima came into our office um, with the diagnosis of nonverbal autism. She was only, she only had about one, maybe two words here or there. She wasn't using sentences at all. And because I don't focus in on what's wrong with, with, with children or individuals when they come in, I, I actually forgot um, you know, what it was that she, you know, some of her more challenging problems because pretty soon she, you know, she was coming in, she was just talking in sentences. She was using three to four words at a time. And I forgot that she originally couldn't because I just don't focus on that. And, and it wasn't until this was four weeks later, I went on, um, I went online looking at uh, Yelp reviews and I saw this and I was blown away. I forgot just, you know, how impacted she was. And I'll never forget the very first time she, she had her first adjustment in the office. I adjusted her neck um, and she popped off the table and, and said, happy. And her parents just looked at each other and, and were just completely amazed. So I, sh I share this slide at the beginning of my talks just to bring about a, um, an awareness of what's possible. 
most people listening in or most people out there have this belief system about chiropractic that it's a treatment for back pain or neck pain. And while those things certainly improve under chiropractic care, um, that's such a, um, uh, it's a limited vision of what chiropractic really is and what it can uh, do in, in your child's life. So um, let's dive into this. Everything that I'm going to talk about today is uh, fully referenced. It comes from these books, these um, journal articles, and a lot more uh, that I wasn't able to put on this screen. But everything uh, that we'll be talking about is fully backed by scientific research. Um, you can contact me for the list of uh, references if you like. Um, I also have an, uh, an ebook that goes that has many of these references. So um, you can go to my website if you're interested uh, for that. I like to start uh, by sharing a story of, of my own son um, because I think his journey um, is really important for people to understand. Uh, this is Tyler. Tyler was four and a half when this picture was taken. He uh, he was a picture of health up at, up to this point. He had he was sick. All he can remember is once in his life at six months he had a cold. Um, other than that, he he never um, really expressed any symptoms. He and you can see it in his eyes. He was just um, beaming health. Um, he lived a, a clean, organic lifestyle, ate um, organic foods, plenty of vegetables. He used to love to just eat raw broccoli and cauliflower. And um, we chose, uh, due to our personal beliefs and philosophy, not to have him vaccinated. He, he never received a vaccination. He'd never taken a medication in his life. Um, so just a really super clean lifestyle. And um, right before, or right after this picture was taken, uh, my family and I left on a nine-month trip around the world. Uh, my wife had convinced me uh, of this really wild idea to to travel around the world, and uh, we sold all of our possessions and just with our backpacks and our family, we we took off on this amazing trip around the world. And uh, the thing was, you know, it was an amazing trip. However, along the way, Tyler got lost. Um, he was no longer the same uh, happy, healthy child that we remembered. About halfway through the trip, he started developing severe, um, what we now see as anxiety. Um, he didn't want to leave the apartment or the house um, we were staying at. He, would, he was really conflicted because on one hand, he wanted to see all these amazing museums and sites and um, attractions, yet it was like pulling teeth trying to get him out of the house. And he became increasingly aggressive and uh, violent. And this is from a four and a half, you know, five-year-old. We thought he was just expressing behavioral, um, uh, you know, symptoms or behaviors due to the stress of travel and going from place to place. And so we we decided to come back to the United States a little bit early, and uh, thought that things would get better. And in fact, they got much much worse um, this photo was taken a little bit after we got back you can see in his eyes the dark circles uh, just the the lack of vitality and the bottom left picture was a, a day where he was just at that point experiencing severe uh, delusions and um, extreme manic and depressive phases um, really not well. He was, and you can see in the bottom right, such extreme anxiety that he only felt safe inside a box. Um, it was an extremely, extremely difficult time, as you can imagine. Many of you um, listening to this can probably relate and um, understand what, what exactly our family was going through. And we're talking about two hours um, each night of, of rage where he was um, going for knives and telling us he wanted to kill us and in an extreme state of, of uh, delusion and, and uh, violent aggression. I was in a state of denial, I believe. You know, I, I, here I was taking care of lots of kids with similar problems, um, yet my son's story was very different. He, he went from very, being very healthy to all of a sudden being at this stage and um, I was in a state where I think, okay, this is behavioral, this is not you know, physical. And uh, he also wouldn't let me adjust him. He wouldn't let me do the one thing that I could actually do for him. Um, so it took uh, my, wife, my wife's prompting and, and me being with him for two weeks at a two-week um, vacation period 
where I saw just how sick he really was and saw just the dark circles and everything. And we took him to a, a holistic pediatrician here in our area who said, this sounds like pandas. And um, I had heard the word pandas once before um, from a mom whose child has actually recovered from autism. And she had said the same thing at that time, though I had uh, not really listened or had not looked into it for any further. However, when this doctor had mentioned it and told us what it was, it made a lot of sense. Um, PANDA stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with Streptococcus. And um, PANS is another name for it, which kind of covers any infectious um, or stressful trigger that could produce um, an autoimmune cascade reaction, which um, an individual will respond to, say, streptococcus or other pathogens um, and create this vicious cycle of um, uh, antibodies that attack the basal ganglia and produce the symptoms such as from ADHD to OCD um, to the rage to uh, paranoia, delusions, lots of different brain-based you know, symptoms. So his first recommendation was to go on something called the specific carb diet, which uh, took out all grains uh, from his diet and big improvement right away. Uh, homeopathy was another uh, tool that, uh, that we use, which again, we saw some great um, changes. So those are, you know, diet is huge. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, and some of the other things that we did for my son, he's now about, since he had this diagnosis two years ago, he's about 85 to 90 percent better. He, uh, we go out all the time. He still has um, some anxiety and some some uh, because his development was stuck and altered. Some learning um, challenges and some focus challenges, uh, but those are improving constantly. So let's let's dive into this. So through this, this presentation, this workshop, we're gonna talk about what's going on, um, you know, why is this happening, and, and most importantly, what's next? How can, how can you improve the quality of life of your child? How can you make changes um, immediately that are going to help their health and quality of life? So just really quickly, um, looking at the statistics, autism is, is on an is rising in epidemic proportions. Back in the 1970s, it was one in 10,000 children were diagnosed with autism. This is an old stat from 2014. It was one in 68, according to the CDC. Um, their latest stats are one in 50. However, those are based on old numbers. And researchers estimate by the year 2020, 2025, that that's gonna be around one in 25 kids diagnosed with autism. Um, so this is a huge epidemic and an a, a international uh, problem. A lot of people will say, well, you know, that rises due to better and earlier diagnosis. However, two of the largest studies, one out of Stanford um, and another one I believe is out of Norway, looked at this rise, this 800% increase, and they could only, both of them could only account for 50% of that rise um, based upon better and earlier diagnosis. And so the other 50%, they both came to the conclusion that it had to be the environment. Because you see, you cannot have a genetic epidemic. Our genes don't change that quickly. And the other thing, if, if autism and these neurodevelopmental issues are truly genetic, especially with autism, many of the um, individuals with autism um, are not having children, a lot of them. And so if this were a genetic epidemic, then we would expect to see those, or a genetic condition, we would expect to see those numbers not rising at this, this huge rate. Um, however, our, our environment has changed. Our environment has changed drastically over the last 50, 100 years. Um, and we know that it's much more toxic today than it was 50, 100 years ago. And that becomes a, a big, big issue for individuals who may have a genetic typing in which they cannot uh, detox um, as well as others. 6.4 million children, 11% of four to 17 year olds um, have been diagnosed with ADHD as of 2011. And again, that's just an R in the United States. That's not a you know, global number by any means. 
This study, they found that adults with ADHD also have many other issues. 47% have anxiety disorders, 38% mood disorders, 19% impulse control disorders, and 15% substance abuse uh, disorder, uh, which makes sense when we consider that the primary treatment for ADHD is a class two controlled substance, you know, methamphetamines basically. And um, so we're setting kids up for, for failure later on in life. You know, it's not to judge the usefulness of those things in certain situations. However, um, realize that it's not without consequences. And, and we see these other, you know, the 47% anxiety and these other disorders, realize that, that this is, uh, you know, the, the, the mainstream system likes to label all these different conditions. We have this alphabet soup now, um, but really, you know, it's not, it's not just because a child has certain symptoms doesn't mean they have this one particular, um, you know, diagnosis. You know, they, it's a sign of global dysfunction. OCD is now thought to affect as many as two to three percent of children. Um, OCD is intense. It's it's not supposed to affect children or, or anybody for that matter, but two to three percent of kids. That may not sound like a lot, but in the United States, that equates to 2.2 million children, um, just a huge number of kids. One in eight or nine million children in the United States have an anxiety disorder. And this is really the crux of the matter. 43% or 32 million children in the United States have at least one of 20 chronic health conditions. You see, it's not that we have um, uh, an increase of all these different conditions. We have, uh, what we have is a sick country. We have a sick society. And when we see numbers like this, um, we need to realize that if we don't do something uh, drastically soon to change that, that um, the future of our children and of our country and, and quite honestly the world is in, um, in dire um, need of change. We, we can't maintain this. It's not sustain, sustainable. And right now the children are, are basically like the canaries in the coal mine. Um, miners used to take canaries into the coal mine because the, the canaries would, um, if there was natural gases, you know, those gases cannot be, there's no smell to those gases, so miners couldn't detect it. The canaries, however, would drop over and die uh, because they couldn't handle the, the gas. And so that would be a sign to the miners to get out of the coal mine. And unfortunately, our kids are the reflection of a very sick environment and sick society. So we have all these labels. You know, we talked a little bit about this. We have autism spectrum disorder, and it's a wide gamut of, of various symptoms from what's labeled high functioning to low functioning. We have oppositional and defiant disorder. We have ADHD, um, OCD, Tourette's, you know, all these different labels. Um, and now we have this pans and pandas on the, on the horizon here. So what's, what's really going on? In my opinion, I look at this as just one big um, uh, situation. You know, I look at it as I, when I talk about neurodevelopmental disorders, I'm talking about one situation impacting kids. And it makes sense if you look at it from a, a neurological perspective. Depending upon when there's injury to the nervous system, whether that's as the, the fetus is developing, you know, or uh, soon after birth, or maybe at six months of life, or one month, or two years, or three years old, depending upon when the nervous system and, and the, the overall health and function of a child is impacted, that will change the symptoms. That will depend upon where the brain is at and the nervous system is at in its development. Will, will dictate what type of symptoms the child will have. So to really understand this, I like to go back to the basics because I believe that, that you and everyone else um, has the blueprint and the understanding uh, for how to be healthy and how to help your children. So in order to do so, I, I like to, to, to relate it to things that we all know and understand. So how do mechanical systems work? What do they need? What does this vehicle uh, need? What does a car need to function? So when I ask this question, the primary responses are, well, it needs fuel, right? So it needs power and it needs parts. It needs an engine, it needs tires, it needs all those different things. However, this vehicle will not move on its own. 
unless it's one of those you know new self-powered self-driving cars that are coming out but assuming it's not this vehicle can't drive itself so the missing piece is the driver right the the information the input that that machine needs input in order to to function so what about computer systems we use these every day i'm using one right now as are you and um, we have these smartphones I mean, what do they need well basically the same thing right they need the parts they need power they need electricity and the information and the information also is that program right those programs that run the the system and you know, what what is a computer based upon right it's 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 really modeled after us right so what do living systems need to work properly right so parts power and information and where are most doctors looking you know for the problem most doctors are looking at the parts Right, they're looking, and then we have all sorts of parts doctors. We have um, stomach doctors, we have brain doctors, we have um, hand doctors, we have uh, shoulder doctors, liver doctors. We have all these different doctors looking at the parts. However, we all know that that our bodies don't work um, and our parts don't work independently. They work as a whole. Right, the body is a holistic um, organism that that needs all the parts working uh, together. So some of doctors are now looking more at the power. You know, what's, what type of fuel are we putting in, in the body? And that's great. You know, we need great fuel. But for proper organization and orchestration of all those parts, all those trillions of cells and all the organ systems, the, it's the information that orchestrates that. It's the information that's traveling over and through the nervous system from the brain down the spinal cord to all the cells of the body orchestrating the amazing process of life that we have neglected in society. We haven't looked at this. We're not even talking about it. But that's, that's the key to health. That's one of the primary factors in orchestrating proper function. So because systems are made of parts, they're all designed to eventually what? Right? They're, they're all eventually designed to break down. You know, none of us are going to live forever. Our bodies do break down. Um, so what, what happens if you take away or change the parts, power, information, say, for a plant? If you have less light, you pollute the water, you poison the soil. So you know, some people say, well, that plant's going to die. Yeah, it, it might. Or it may not um, express the best health, right? It may have wilty leaves. It, it may not uh, produce the best fruit or any fruit, for that matter. So it's, gonna, it's not going to be expressing its optimal health and potential. So what if, what if you take away or disturb the parts, power, information for a human being? Right? You have less light, less movement. You pollute the water. There's toxins. Right? So, so we all know the answer. And this is, this is all based upon cause and effect. So symptoms, we typically look at symptom as being bad, right? We, we want to get rid of a headache. We want to get rid of symptoms. However, symptoms we need to realize are just the perfect expression of the state of our parts, power, and information. The health of our parts, the quality of the power, and the integrity of that information, how that information is able to travel over and through the nervous system to orchestrate this thing called health and function. So... This is a diagram uh, from Dr. Paul Hardy. He's a medical doctor who specializes in the biomedical treatment of autism. He's on the board of the um, Autism Research Institute. And he calls it this the autism quadrangle. Now, I labeled it at the top neurodevelopmental quadrangle because it really applies not only to autism but to this wide gamut of situations your children might be facing. So if you notice, you know, he calls this a whole body disorder. You know, at the very top is the nervous system. Why do you think that he put the nervous system at the top of this diagram? Well, the, the, the key there is that the nervous system is the master system. It orchestrates the function and coordination of all the other systems. Yes, there's arrows going between the other systems. However, if you have an injury to your nervous system, a spinal cord injury, you can die immediately or, or be ser seriously paralyzed. So the nervous system is, is the primary system. We also have the immune system, the detoxification system, and the gastrointestinal system. In the middle, he has the genome, or the individual genetics of, an, of a person. 
And on the left, we see the environment and all these multiple toxins coming through this individual with their particular genetics and the different health and state of, of their various systems. And that will then produce the different types of autism. You know, and that ex really kind of explains why we see this wide spectrum, why some kids are super high functioning um, while other children are really impacted and low functioning, you know, nonverbal, not very responsive to their environment and to others. And in my opinion, really explains why we see this, this huge um, uh, you know, number of, of various uh, types of neurodevelopmental disorders and, and why we have all these different labels. Another way to look at this, this is what I call the neurodevelopmental disorder trifecta. An individual will, will potentially have a genetic predisposition, okay, meaning that, say, uh, they, they, due to their genes, they don't have the best uh, detoxification. Um, 50 or 100 years ago, it may not have been a problem. You know, they, they wouldn't have necessarily started to get sick because the environment was much different back then. The food quality was much different. The toxins were much less. So an individual may have a genetic predisposition or, or they're potentially um, injured from something in the environment. Uh, my family lived close to a farm for several years uh, before my son was born. Um, and then after, and, and was a farm in which they sprayed um, pesticides. Um, we have, we're finding um, pharmaceuticals in our water supply in, in mountaintops, distant mountaintops, we're finding pharmaceuticals. Um, There's a study done in um, Canada that looked at the cord blood of um, mothers, and they found over 200 chemicals that shouldn't be in the blood. Um, and so if children are being bathed, then these toxic chemicals, it makes sense that their nervous systems are going to be potentially injured and altered at a critical point in development. So with this situation, um, we then have the situation where we have microbiome depletion. And the microbiome we're going to hear a lot more of um, over the years. It's, it's, there's, if you look it up in the, in the literature, you'll see lots of papers coming out talking about the microbiome because it's, it's hugely important in our development of our health and function. So the microbiome is basically the, the makeup of our bacteria in our gastrointestinal system in our bodies. Our micro, we know now that there's, there's you know, what we call good bacteria, bacteria that are very positive and necessary, and we have this symbiotic relationship in which these bacteria help to digest food and they help in many different processes in the body and we have trillions of them in this. But there's also harmful bacteria, bacteria that can um, become dominant and, and create serious problems. And so if we have the uh, a depletion or altered microbiome, it can cause um, some major problems. Some of the things that uh, we see in the research that cause microbiome depletion include cesarean section deliveries, um, which are quite common nowadays and have been increasing for years. Um, the, the reason cesarean sections are problems is because the, one of the main ways that a child uh, gets their, the start to their microbiome is through the, coming through the vaginal canal and being introduced to the, the bacteria in the, the mother's vaginal canal. Antibiotics. Um, are being prescribed at um, just uh, extraordinary rates, and even the scientific community is really urging that uh, that practice be limited uh, because we're developing various superbugs uh, due to the, the overuse of antibiotics. Antibiotics kill everything. Anti meaning against, biotics meaning life. So they kill all the bacteria. And when you wipe out the bacteria, especially at a young age, it allows for the, the bad bacteria to take over. Um, so the antibiotics are a huge factor. Tylenol also has been shown to uh, deplete the microbiome, and it's one of the, uh, it's commonly recommended for anything from toothaches to fevers, you name it, it's, it's being recommended um, excessively. Inability to breastfeed, why is that a problem? A couple of reasons. One, the child's not getting the, all those great immune system uh, boosters, but also another way that the microbiome is passed on to the, to the child. Um, and this last one, a hypersympathetic response. We're going to talk a lot about that um, in a little bit. 
um, and the, because that's a really, really big one. So all of this leads to a, a condition known as leaky gut. A lot of you have probably heard about this, some of you may have not, but basically it sounds like uh, just what it is. So a leaky gut means that the stomach and the intestinal lining become leaky. Um, the stomach and the intestines should only allow um, certain things through um, the lining because there's lots of uh, various things that come into our stomach, such as various bacteria, pathogens, parasites, um, you know, food particles, things like that, um, that shouldn't be getting into our bloodstream. And so when the, the gut becomes leaky, when, those, when, those, um, when we get basically um, holes in our stomach lining and gut, it allows for these things to get into the bloodstream for food, undigested food particles, uh, proteins, things like that get in, which um, shouldn't be there. And what is the intelligent response of the body to something that shouldn't be there, to an invader? Well, we know that the immune system kicks in and inflammation is produced. The body get, goes into an immune response. And when this becomes chronic, this leads to chronic immune response, chronic inflammation, and basically a situation where we have autoimmune reactions, we have hypersensitivities, allergies, because food particles are getting in that shouldn't be in the bloodstream. And over time, this leads to multiple pathogens and eventually brain inflammation because this process will lead to what's known as leaky brain, in which the brain, the blood brain barrier now becomes leaky as well and allows for and leads to uh, brain inflammation, pathogens, multiple nutritional deficiencies because now the stomach lining is not and the intestines are not absorbing nutrients as well and to multiple toxicities in the system. Now this is a really um, uh, not a very positive uh, point in this presentation. Every time I give this presentation I look into the audience and people feel overwhelmed. Um, I was overwhelmed uh, as well because it is a very difficult um, process to heal and to address. It's not easy. Um, neurodevelopmental challenges, much like autoimmune challenges uh, for adults, um, are extremely challenging health situations. However, they can indeed um, respond and heal and improve. My son's stomach um, is much, much better. His intestines, his, his bowel function, much better. You'll find that many children with neurodevelopmental issues have constant chronic constipation and or diarrhea, their stools are not properly formed, it's extremely foul spell, smelling. These are all signs that your child has um, a leaky gut and uh, that this situation needs to be addressed because if that gut isn't healed and sealed, it will lead to chronic um, problems and chronic inflammation in the brain. So what's next? This is where we now transition. This is where we talk about how to improve the health of your child and how to take back their health and, and improve their function. So I like to start by sharing a story about baking a cake. A lot of you probably like to, to bake, and we're going to use the ingredients for health in this cake. Okay, So I believe you all know the ingredients for health. Um, we all do, right? We may not always be using those ingredients, but the, the basic ingredients for health are good, clean air, water, sunshine, uh, movement, exercise, right? Positive mental attitude, um, plenty of sleep. These are, these are what we call the ingredients for health. This is what the body needs. These are, this helps give the body the, the proper power, right? To use, to grow new cells, to function. And so, um, Let's imagine we're going to use these ingredients to bake the cake. And so I'm going to, I'm going to throw some eggs into a bowl. I'm not going to crack them, though. I'm just going to throw them in the bowl uh, with the shells. I'm going to pour um, some butter in, and I'm going to mix it up a little bit with the shells and all, um, and then squeeze some frosting in and throw this um, mixture into a pan and put it in the oven for 30 minutes, and then take it out, and I'm going to, I'm going to pour some flour on top. Okay, so how many of you would like to have a piece of this cake? Probably not very many of you, right? So what did I miss? What, what did I not follow? You see, the thing I missed, the thing that we're missing as a society, the thing that's probably not being addressed in the health of your child 
is the recipe. See, the recipe is the central nervous system. The recipe is the nervous system, the spinal cord, and, and the messages that travel over and through that system that orchestrate the health and function of the body. And this is the piece of healthcare that we've been missing for way too long. We, we're, we're just neglecting it. Okay, the, the spinal cord, as you can see from this chart, it shows how the, we develop. You know, the very first thing to develop is the spinal cord, the brain and the spinal cord, because that's the, the roadmap. That's the, how the, the rest of the body develops around that. Off the spinal cord come the, the spinal nerves, which go to the organs, and the organs are developed. And that connection never leaves, right? The, the body, in order to function, has to have, and the brain has to have constant awareness of the state and the health of each organ and the systems and orchestrate this amazing process of life. And so when we come out of, of our mothers at nine months, you know, is that brain fully developed? No, absolutely not, right? If it were, the child would come out and ask for the keys for, to the car to go out on a Friday night, right? However, you know, that, and that, so it's not the case. The brain is, is just in its infancy and, and now needs to, to actually grow and develop. So just a little uh, refresher here so you can see, here's the brain and the spinal cord at the very top here is the brain stem, which we're gonna talk more about. The spinal cord is covered by something known as the meninges, which is basically like a, uh, a fibrous, um, like balloon-like material around the, the spinal cord. It allows for cerebral spinal fluid, this fluid to circulate around the spinal cord and the brain to bring nourishment, to bring nutrients, and to flush out toxins. And the system is encased in bone. So why do you think that the brain and the spinal cord are encased in bone? Well, it's, it's pretty obvious, right? It's for protection. This is the most important and most vital um, organ system in your body. And so it's protected. You know, we have our skeletons on the inside. Other animals have their skeletons on the outside. We have our rib cage even there to protect the other vital organs, but even those aren't encased in bone because the, the spinal cord is that sensitive and that important and that vital to our health and function. So the role of the nervous system is to act like this big sponge, basically soaking in our environment. Scientists estimate that 11 trillion bits of information is processed every second of the day by the brain. 11 trillion bits, so just imagine all that information coming in through our eyes, through our ears, through taste, through touch, constantly bombarded with this information. So if your child's filter isn't working very well, can you imagine how hard it might be to experience the world, to be able to focus if, they're, if, they, if their nervous system is not properly developed to handle all this information from their body and from their environment? They become overwhelmed and they go into fight or flight or freeze physiology, which we're gonna talk about. Here we have just, so you can see this, the back of the head. Here we have this, the upper neck. And then when you can see the red vessels there, that's the, the main blood supply to the brain. It comes up through the neck, through the spinal bones, then wraps around and goes up with the spinal cord into the, the brain there. We've all had this test done before, likely by, by a doctor somewhere where they, they have a little hammer, they're, they're hitting your knee and, and they're checking the reflex, right? It's a basic reflex, you know, if you're, if you're if your foot kicks really fast, that's a sign of uh, maybe your nervous system is hyperactive. It's, it's, it's too quick. And if it's not much of a kick at all, it means that your nervous system is really slow, really sluggish. It's a really basic way to check um, the nervous system function. Here we have the autonomic nervous system and, and lots of these reflexes throughout the body. This is how our body functions without us having to think about it, right? So it's called the autonomic nervous system. Uh, I like to call it the automatic system because it does everything automatically. You don't have to think about breathing. You don't have to think about regulating your blood pressure or digesting your food. It just happens automatically for us. Now, this incredibly important system is divided into two sides. On one side on the right, you see it says sympathetic nervous system at the top there. That's known as the fight, fight, or freeze system. Okay, that's, that's the response that happens when there's some perceived danger. Okay, and I say perceived because we all have different responses to situations. 
one situation might seem dangerous to one person, while not at all to another. That's a big reason why many of your children uh, have trouble with transitioning, why they are fearful of certain individuals or places or things, the unknown, because their, their nervous system is in high state of alert. So the sympathetic fight, flight or freeze system does just that. If, if, if there's a danger, say there's a tiger or you hear a, a burglar at night, your, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure, um, you know, it increases to move blood to from your brain and from your um, your digestive system to your muscles, your big muscles, so you can either run or fight. Okay, so how many of your children uh, shut down? They freeze, kind of like a deer, and you know, it's stuck in the headlights, or they go into fight, they get aggressive, um, or they flee, they run. Okay, this this is this means that they're in a fight, flight, or freeze physiology. Their nervous system is stuck in that state. Now that that side is very positive when there's a temporary danger because that's a good response if there's a danger for survival. However, if we get stuck there, that means that the other side, the parasympathetic nervous system can't kick in and can't function like it's supposed to to calm the system back down and to get into what is the healing, resting, digestion, and development side of things. Okay, that's, that's where digestion happens, it's where, um, it's where we're thriving, it's where we're growing, it's where the brain can get into a stage of development, because we can't grow when we're in defense. It's, it's impossible. Our, our body uh, physiology is not designed for that. So what happens if we're stuck in chronic fight or flight and freeze physiology? Our bodies break down. They're not designed to stay there. They can't repair, they can't heal, they can't sleep well, they can't get into those stages of repair and we can't develop. And so I hope right now you're starting to understand and see your child's behaviors a little differently because a lot of times we wanna modify behaviors, we wanna change behaviors, but we need to realize that the behaviors are only a reflection of, of their nervous system and how they've learned to respond to their environment. You know, because of the nervous system and then through learned behaviors over time because of that. So this is how we process information. Okay, sensory information, number one, sensory reception, it comes in through our eyes, our ears, um, but also, look at the very bottom here, the proprioceptive system. This system, some of you may have heard of, it's a system that allows us to stand on one foot and balance, close our eyes, and bring our fingertips to our nose. It's, it coordinates um, our awareness of where our body is in space. Okay, how many of your kids are bumping into things and, and very clumsy, injuring themselves constantly? You know, see, the proprioceptive, proprioceptive system um, gets its information from the muscles, the skin, um, but the joints of the body, primarily from the spine, though, and especially the upper neck. And that's super important. Okay, this system is the only system, sensory information, that doesn't turn off. Okay, while you're sleeping at night, that system is still sending information to your brain. You've probably all have experienced this where you're maybe on the edge of your bed and, and you're sleeping and all of a sudden you roll towards the edge and, and you're about to fall and, and you wake up before you fall, hopefully, right? That's because that proprioceptive system was sending information to your brain which alerted your brain and that fight or flight response kicked in and your body uh, jolted and caught itself. Okay, what an amazing system, right? So. So that information comes up and then it's processed, okay, in the brainstem. It goes to the brainstem where it's processed and then it goes, from there it goes to the cerebellum, which is the big area in the back of the brain, and to the, the thalamus and then to the other parts of the brain where then the body can respond. Okay, the brain can then send information telling your body how to act. So I share this slide here of, of Brett because Brett was in major fight or flight. He was hiding under table when I first saw him. He was so scared. His eyes were darting around. You'll see that with a lot of your children. Their, their pupils are really big. Um, they're constantly scanning their environment for any dangers. Um, they're in a fight or flight physiology. Brett was also having up to 800 seizures a month. Um, since starting chiropractic and adding chiropractic, his sensory processing problems, his issues with clothing, tags, um, different um, sensory input is vastly improved and his seizures are down by 90%. Okay, what a, what a, what a huge impact and change. He never smiled, now he's smiling, now he's beginning to thrive, he's beginning to speak, he wasn't speaking before and that now he's beginning to, to function because he's not stuck in that fight or flight physiology anymore.
This is the pyramid of learning. This is super important for parents to understand where your children are at and super important for, for educators. In fact, parents, you might want to share this with your, your children's teachers and with the principals um, so they can see this because this is really important to understand where your children are at in their academic development, their entire development, um, and where they're at in the learning process. At the very bottom, we have the central nervous system. Obviously, that's that foundation, right? There we have things like um, taste, sight, hearing, uh, touch, balance, but, and then see proprioception down there at that foundation at the bottom. As the brain, as the child comes out and is developing, they're getting all the sensory input. We have these things called primitive reflexes that are there for survival. If you touch a child's, um, you stroke a child's face they're from their lip out to the side, they'll turn their head and neck that direction. It's a, a reflex for survival. They're turning to, to find the breast, to find the nipples so that they can feed. We have other reflexes that are also there for survival and also so we can begin to interact with our environment, starting to touch things, reach for things, see things, basically feeding the brain information that it will use to develop greater levels of organization, okay, greater levels of development. Because once that's been reached, then the body can get into sensory motor development. Then we, the, the child will have awareness of both sides of the body. There's better motor planning where they can, they see something and they, they purposely go for it. Um, there's increase in uh, reflexes. So now, now we see um, they're beginning to develop uh, postural reflexes and get into the next stage, which is perceptual motor. Now the child can interact much more with the environment. The more they can interact with the environment, now they're starting to develop eye-hand coordination. They can adjust their posture. All of that is building connections in the brain, um, pathways that then lead to language. They lead to uh, being able to focus. And then at the very pinnacle at the top, we have higher levels of uh, cognition and intellect. We have daily living activities, behavior, and academic learning. And see, where do we expect kids to be typically when they enter grade school? You know, we're, we're just expecting kids to, to have had this normal uh, brain development when there could have been multiple stages that, that they missed, um, stages where they need um, more work to develop that so that they can actually get into these higher levels of being able to do daily living activities like dress themselves and brush their teeth and do these things and having proper behavior being you know being socially uh, appropriate and, and all these things and and then academic learning being able to, to really get, get to where we all want our children to be and so I hope this helps you understand where, you know, where you, because you can look, see, okay, where is my child currently having um, some problems? You know, where are they, maybe did they miss a stage? Um, because then you can actually, if you work on it, you work on those areas, the child's brain will begin to develop even more. So Bondin came to us. Um, he couldn't jump. One, one of his legs was a, an inch shorter, um, and it was also an inch um, around the circumference was a lot much smaller yet no one had ever seen that um, he was constantly hurt himself falling um, he couldn't he couldn't his body just wasn't working properly he wasn't getting the proper input to the brain and so the brain couldn't respond um, we started taking care of him now Bonin's riding a bike doing karate running jumping all these things that he, he couldn't do so so where's that disconnect you know if we go back to the beginning I talked about um, we're designed to be healthy. You know, the body's looking for optimal health and function, and if we're not there, there, there must be some disconnect. So scientists, researchers, most doctors out there are looking at the brain as a problem. They're looking for some genetic problem. They're looking at the brain, you know, pathways not being right, brain um, chemistry problems. Yet the brain does not develop in a vacuum, okay? You know, they're looking at it through this microscope. The brain needs input to develop. It actually needs all this information. So what do you think would happen if you see all those, the, the eye, the mouth, the hand, all those senses over there? What would happen if the body wasn't able to get that information or if that information was altered on its way to the brain? You think that might alter the response? Of course it would. It's like a computer. If you put bad information into a computer, you're going to get a bad response. Okay, and so, so we're not looking um, in the right place. 
this article asks the question, is the autistic brain too wired or not wired enough? The answer is really both. You know, they've done so many tests looking at the brain, brain pathways, and they're not conclusive. One study shows one thing, another study shows the other. And again, I think it's because every brain is different. Every brain is getting different information throughout a lifetime. Okay, so there's different paths to development. And it's, it's these two, two terms here, two concepts which really explain this. Okay, the first one is disaffrontation. Dis meaning dysfunction. Affrontation means the information coming from the body, information coming up to the brain. So up the spinal cord to the brain. Basically, it's an imbalance of sensory information into the brain. Okay, so if you have, if that information is altered, if, or if the body's not getting a, a, a great view of what's happening both in the external environment or the internal environment of the body, that's going to change the way the brain develops and functions. We also have this term at the bottom, neuroplasticity. You're going to hear a lot more about this. Many of you probably have. Neuro meaning nervous system. Plasticity from plastic meaning changeable. And this is a message of hope. It means that the nervous system constantly changes. It's constantly, the brain is constantly learning to grow and evolve and develop to higher levels of organization and higher levels of health and function. And so if we change the information, we can change the brain, basically. And you all can relate to this. We've all learned how to walk, talk, drive a car. If any of you uh, play a piano or, or any, do any skill with your hands, you know that over time as you do it more and more, you actually become much better at it. Okay, and sometimes you don't even have to think about it because it be, these these connections these in your brain get developed, and the more you do it, they become almost hardwired. Okay, and now this this means that you can also have negative neuroplasticity. If you're getting bad information in, if you're having bad input, then that's going to create negative, um, you know, or connections that aren't that as healthy. Connections that lead to things like OCD and leads to um, other focus uh, problems, things like that. This is a great book, The Brain That Changes Itself. Highly recommend you, you check that out. It's by Dr. Norman Doidge talking about this concept of neuroplasticity and how the brain is constantly changing. It really is a message of hope because it means that you can change your brain and you can change your child's brain today and tomorrow based upon the quality of the input that they're receiving. This book, um, Disconnected Kids, highly recommend it. Uh, it's by Dr. Robert Melillo. Um, and this article that he wrote on primitive reflexes, this is really important. We talked about primitive reflexes a little bit ago. He says, normally after the first few months of life, the feedback, so the information created by the primitive reflexes, so as the child's beginning to explore their environment, all that information leads to those reflexes going away. Those reflexes should start to go away or be inhibited. And it leads to the activation of more complex postural reflexes, which we talked about. Now the child can engage in their environment more which in turn leads to greater sensory feedback, which actually activates genes. Okay, there's genes that are activated. So these, this process has to happen in order to allow for the creation of integration and coordination between the various networks in the brain. Okay, and if stages are missed, if a child, say, doesn't um, crawl, you know, if they start going to standing up, if, they, if they're not doing a lot of stomach crawling, if they're, if they're missing any stages there, or if they're not getting the proper information, it's going to alter the brain trajectory. It's going to alter the development of the brain. So what's next? You know, I say, where's the disconnect? Again, because in order to get to optimal health and function, we need to not look at it from a, a treatment of behaviors or symptoms, but look at it, how do we improve health? And I say it takes a village because this problem is so huge that obviously it takes more than, than only seeing the chiropractor to improve the health and wellness of your child's nervous system. There, you have to look at healing and sealing the gut. Um, and I don't do that, and, and I don't recommend to, that my colleagues do that either. I, I believe that this problem is so big that, they, that you need to see the specialists. You need to see the, the very specialists in biomedical uh, treatment of these problems. There's um, doctors known as DANS um, or MAPS doctors. You can go to um, TACA, talk about curing autism. Um, that organization has lots of resources that you can look into. But I have this slide because, again, it, it, it's a multi-pronged approach. But I, I think that 
you have the keys now to understand what you need to do. You, know, you need to look at, you know, does your child have any, maybe they have some problems with detoxification. You can actually look into that. Um, there's a testing, 23andme.com, 23andme.com. You can look at the genetics of your child, see if they have issues with detoxification. We'll let you know if you need to um, really support uh, detoxification more so. Um, healing and sealing the gut, we know that you need to do that. You need to support the brain. Based on this diagram here, it tells you that you need to improve the health and function of the nervous system. You need to support the immune system, support the detoxification system, and the GI system. So, so where does the disconnect? Again, now this is, this is the piece where chiropractic comes in. This is the piece that's been um, uh, not recognized and been neglected um, in healthcare in general and especially in neurodevelopmental um, disorders. Okay, and this is the piece regarding the information we talked about at the beginning. Okay, and, and what chiropractors do is check the spine. We check the spine for misalignments of a vertebrae, what's known as a vertebral subluxation. If there's a misalignment of the, the spine, especially in the upper neck, that's going to distort the information that's traveling to or from the brain and or impact the flow of the blood flow or that cerebrospinal fluid that we talked about in the beginning of this presentation. We know that in society that structure always affects function. If you were to take a, a, a beam out of a bridge, you know that that will affect the strength and stability of that bridge and ultimately the function and safety of that bridge. The spine is no different. Our human frame is no different. The, the, the skull and spinal, cord, or spinal column, the bones are there to protect that delicate system. However, because our bodies are designed to break down and because we have multiple stressors and traumas, our spines will indeed misalign. And when that happens, it can cause disaffrontation, what we talked about earlier, which are basically negative neuroplastic changes. It can cause decreased brainstem and or blood flow. It can alter the cerebral spinal fluid, which we talked about, and it can cause tension in the spinal cord itself, which will alter the nerve function and will alter the overall function and health of the body. So here's some of the, the research looking into this. Um, this study back in 2007 was looking at uh, um, adjusting the spine and how that alters um, integration of information. Okay, what they found is that spinal dysfunction, you know, a, a misalignment of the, spine, of the spine alters the input going into the brain. So it causes disaffrontation. And that altered input will lead to neuroplastic changes. Now, these changes are functional, and I highlighted that because it's super important. Functional means reversible. So if there's a problem and you correct it, now the body is getting the proper information. Now the body and the brain can begin to correct and heal and correct these imbalances because it is constantly striving and looking for optimal health and function. That's what the, the, the brain does. This study, it was talking about subluxation and saying that it can create neuroplastic changes. Again, these are functional changes um, due to the altered input, due to the, the misinformation getting to the brain. This doctor um, did a study on the cerebellum. Remember, if you look at the bottom left, that's that area that, that is involved in processing information. They found that movement of the spine actually stimulates the cerebellum and gets is, is one of the main drivers of the cerebellum. So, which is responsible for movement of the body, our thoughts, feelings, emotions, and an over, overall health of the organs and the immune system. So we know that subluxation can, can cause a fight or flight response. And this particular study looked at um, adjusting the spine and they found that neck adjustments had a parasympathetic or calming resting, healing, digesting, and development effect. So it took the body out of fight or flight and into the healing, resting, and digesting side of that, that nervous system, created that autonomic nervous system balance. Here's three more studies all looking at that. Um, in chiropractic, we're using what's known as heart rate variability, and not just in chiropractic, it's actually gold standard for measuring auto, the autonomic nervous system, measuring that balance between the fight or flight and the healing, resting, and digesting and development side. And these three studies are all finding the same things, that, that, that the 
that chiropractic has, has, produces a healthy autonomic nervous system balance once that vertebral subluxation is corrected, once that's addressed. With the heart rate variability, um, sometimes we can't always get that test for children, um, depending upon the, the type of um, tool that's being used. Um, in our office, we use a, a machine that, or the child places their hand in the device or adult, and they need to sit still for, for five minutes, basically. So a lot of kids, we don't start with that. Um, instead, in, in our office and in a lot of offices, we use something called paraspinal thermography, which is measuring the skin temperature um, on both sides of the spine, and it's looking for any imbalance, um, any heat temperature imbalances. Uh, because based upon this study mentioned here, um, there's a known normal range. It should be within 0.5 degrees, and, and the degree of imbalance, the higher the degree of imbalance, indicates the higher level of imbalance in the autonomic nervous system. And you can see on the right there, there's a scan, the red bars indicate extremely high levels of temperature imbalance. Um, which means that that autonomic nervous system is far from being balanced. It's also very one-sided as well, so that we should see, be seeing white and green bars kind of going back and forth there. Now, he, this is my son, Tyler. This is, this is on a, um, if you remember back in the first picture, there's a picture of him drawing on him, or markers on his face. Um, it was the day where I, I actually was able to finally check him. He, wasn't, he hadn't allowed me to actually check his spine for about six months, maybe longer. Um, I had this idea of insp this inspirational moment where I said, oh, let me, let me draw, I let him draw on me. I said, let me draw on your back too. And I, and I checked his spine and, and I asked him if I could take a picture so he could see it too. And I was just, um, just blown away by what I saw. And just, uh, you can imagine as a chiropractor too, this is my own child, just how I felt. Um, Take a look at this. You can see the imbalance in his ear position, that left ear um, so much further uh, you know, down on the left there. And those positions of the shoulder, the winging of the scapula on the right, and even a rotation of his pelvis to the right there. This is, this is what we're looking at here. This is the response of a nervous system in extreme distress and tension. When it's in a state of extreme tension, the spine is going to be torqued and twisted around that, and subluxation will cause that, and it and that and it's a degenerative process. The more stress and tension in your nervous system, the more imbalance in your spine, which which leads to more imbalance in the nervous system. It's a cyclical process, and I'm happy to say it no longer looks like this because he's we've gotten to a place where he allows me to check him regularly. Uh, however your child probably has many of these imbalances. So I encourage you to take a look, you know, look at them from behind, look at the shoulder position and look at the ear position, um, have them lay on a bed flat on their back and look at their leg lengths. Are they equal? If they're not, that's a very strong indication that they have an upper neck misalignment. They have an upper neck subluxation there. So we know that the chiropractic impacts the brain. This is really cool. We're starting to see now functional MRIs um, looking at how chiropractic um, is impacting brain function. And in this study, they found that the adjustment affects how the body uses glucose, how it metabolizes glucose. And they believe that this, this improvement in function, this improvement in um, efficiency of the brain was related to the sympathetic um, relaxation. So that fight or flight response um, was reduced and that pain uh, response was reduced and that allowed the brain to, to be more functional. Basically the brain's getting a better um, idea of how to work. The, this um, this uh, book here, The Cranial Cervical Syndrome and MRI, there's a, a section, a chapter, looking at um, pre and post studies, functional MRIs, looking at misalignments of the upper neck. They found that it can cause neural compromise, so irritation of the nervous system, and also contribute to, um, to a decrease of the flow of the cerebral spinal fluid, as well as the the artery and vein supply, okay? And they also found that, um, that that compression, basically the misalignment causes compression of the blood supply and the nerve or the cerebral spinal and um, drainage of the blood supply as well. And when they did a, an adjustment, they found that afterwards, they did another um, functional MRI imaging, they saw an improvement in that flow. 
I believe that's probably one of the greatest reasons Liam saw the changes he did. Liam went from having up to 60 seizures a day to being seizure free. He's now been seizure free for three years. Um, his, his neurologist had told him that his EEGs and his MRIs would never be normal. Um, after two weeks of chiropractic care, his, he went from having 60 seizures a day uh, to uh, just a few. After a month of chiropractic care, he went. He never had a seizure again, and he's now been seizure free for three years. Um, and there's no reason to believe that he'll ever have another one. So, what causes subluxation? You probably realize it by now. It's it's basically stress. It's traumas, uh, physical stress, chemical stressors that are in our environment, and mental emotional stress. We all experience these. Children are experiencing them at young ages. Some of the, the common causes of subluxation, because subluxations are very common, is the birth process. You know, this study looked at 1,000 infants. 80% were found to have misalignments of the upper neck. Um, you know, in the, this is just in the first month of life. Okay. This study, 1,250 infants were checked. 90% had suffered birth trauma. 10% uh, was more uh, severe. You see... Birth trauma is actually quite common. It's, it's not recognized though, okay? This German medical doctor calls it KISS syndrome, okay? He thinks he discovered this. What he's actually talking about is chiropractic, or what chiropractic discovered, what we call the vertebral subluxation. So he says that these delicate upper neck structures undergo considerable stress during delivery. Most of that input, those proprioceptive signals, come from the upper neck. That, that area of the upper neck and any obstacle impeding these these signals will have many more extensive consequences in a developing nervous system which depends more on appropriate stimuli to organize itself basically that body that brain needs that input and if it's altered and if it's the body is put into a fight or flight physiology at birth it's going to alter the brain development and and so some of the primary risk factors he recognizes long labors um, C-section delivery is one of them. It's not listed. Um, vacuum extraction, forceps, um, position of the child, and twins or triplets. This medical doctor way back in 1969 recognized this. He said the birth process, even under optimal control conditions, is a potentially traumatic crippling event for the fetus. Spinal cord and brainstem injuries often occur during the process of birth but frequently escape diagnosis. So why does it escape diagnosis? Well, unfortunately, it comes down to this. Who's checking? Nobody's checking. Nobody's talking about this. You know, the child gets checked, and if everything, you know, if their APGAR score is good, they're, they're sent home with the mother. No one checked to see if there was any trauma to the neck. Um, the children that have more intense trauma, they're signs. Absolutely, they're signs. Um, they're extremely colicky. They're having digestion issues. They're not feeding. They're having trouble turning their, their heads. Their heads may be stuck to one side. Um, they may only favor one breast over the other. They're having failure to thrive. Um, they're stuck in a fight or flight physiology. They're not sleeping well. Um, many of you probably can relate to this. Many of your children um, were potentially born via C-section or a vacuum or forcep delivery. Um, you can see from that cesarean section delivery that, that there's extreme pressures on that child's neck. Um, so in my belief system, based on well, what I know and what I've shared here, every child needs to be checked after birth because of the potentially um, dangerous situation and trauma, even in the most you know, normal natural births. So I always share this slide at the end of all my talks because the last thing I want anyone to believe is that chiropractic is a treatment for autism, that it's a treatment for ADHD, that it's a treatment for seizures, that it's a treatment for low back pain. You see, this study looked at all these different um, reports in the literature of people under what we call wellness care, people under asymptomatic care, they didn't have any symptoms. They're under wellness care, getting their spine and nervous system checked periodically, kind of like people go and have their teeth checked. And what they found is that these people had significant improvements in autonomic function, immune function, they're not getting sick as often, athletic ability, um, their overall stress levels, um, their cognitive function, visual acuity. So why did all these things improve? You know, if we're not treating symptoms, if we're not looking to treat disease, why were all these things improving? You know, I think you've probably realized that the answer is very simple. 
we're improving the health and function of the nervous system, the very system that's responsible for organizing and orchestrating all the functions of the body. And if there's stress on that system, even if it's not producing symptoms yet, and you remove that stress, then the body's going to improve, the function's going to improve. And that's why I choose to have my spine checked on a periodic basis, I get checked every two weeks. I check my family weekly to every other week. To, um, many people experience the same type of great improvements that, that chiropractors have been seeing for over 100 years. You know, in my belief system, all individuals should have their spine and nervous system checked throughout a lifetime, just like you go and have your, your teeth checked. We all should have our, our spine and nervous system checked and, and adjusted if necessary. Here's some before and afters um, scans that we do in our office. This is Hector. Hector, um, you can see he had extreme imbalances. It was 2.5 degrees warmer on the right and 1.8 degrees warmer on the left at C2. Extreme imbalances. He was in extreme fight or flight. He bit his mother on the first visit, nonverbal, um, tantruming 90% of the day. Very hard to control and to handle. This was his follow-up scan two months later. We were actually able to get a full scan that day. We weren't able to on the first visit because of how, um, how aggressive he was. He went from, in one visit, one adjustment, he went from tantruming 90% of the day to 10%. Um, such a huge shift. He went from wanting to bite and fight to, to hugging and kissing. Uh, just huge change. He was probably having extreme migraines, um, extreme headaches. He used to hit his head against the wall. Um, the school um, teachers were just blown away by the changes, as was his family. This is an ATEC form. We use these in the office, autism treatment evaluation checklist. You want to have a lower score, as you can see on the right. Um, a two-month average, we're seeing a 30-point drop in, in scores. So we're seeing a huge improvement in health and function. Oftentimes, people don't know how their child's going to get checked. Um, they envision their child having to lay on a table, at least in my office. That's not the case. And most pediatric chiropractors um, are able to adjust the child, check the child in any position, whether they're laying on the floor, whether they're in front of our fish tank, um, playing with toys. There's so many ways. It's extremely safe, gentle, and effective. And, um, and so... So, but you need to find a qualified pediatric chiropractor. I recommend you go to the ICPA, the number four, kids.org, ICPA4kids.org to find a pediatric and family chiropractor um, in your area. So this is, this is Cynthia. And Cynthia, I just want to play this quick um, video from Cynthia. It's been really cool since uh, my son Nick has been going to Dr. Steve. Uh, we've seen a lot of improvement in him, a lot through his speech. His vocabulary has grown vastly. Uh, he's using a lot more words. I'm able to have more conversations with him. Um, he's on the autism spectrum, and so it's been a while since I, I never really expected to be able to have such good conversations with him, but now he's expressing himself. Um, and I really get to see his personality shine through a lot more, so it's been really a blessing. Um, even like when he's, he's running and playing, I can see he has more control over his body. We're just seeing uh, so much improvement in all areas of his life. At school, uh, they've been really impressed in the last few months. He's been growing uh, so much, been able to be more focused and be able to just be more hey, successful. How you doing? Be more successful in uh, school all together. <laughs> Good job. Look at his extra hand. Yeah. Where's mom? Look, come here. Let's see. There she is. Yes. <laughs> You're silly. You're silly. You want to say hi to the camera? Hi. Hi. Sure. How about like this? You and me. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi. <laughs> all right. Bye. We'll see you later. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's great. So I, I share their story because um, there's a lot of children out there like Nicholas. You know, Nicholas is thriving now. You know, you know, his mom, some of the things she said, he's, he's just starting. His whole body's working better. He's able to have conversations. He's speaking better. The school saw improvements in, in so many areas. And the answer is so simple. We just improved the quality of the information, getting to the brain and to the body. And, and that's what chiropractic is. And you know, I'd just like to, to end with this. Um, 
this slide here. This is Whitney. And Whitney um, brought to me a letter that just rocked my world. She, her mom came to one of my talks. Um, she's 19, but her mom came because she had been struggling with Whitney for over a decade. Uh, for years, Whitney had wanted to kill herself. She was cutting herself. She, um, she didn't want to live anymore. And she, she, had, she begged her daughter to come to me to get checked. Um, after the first adjustment, she felt she wanted to live. She saw the world through completely new perspective. It, it was such a huge adjustment to her spine was so subluxated. It was interfering. She wasn't having pain. That's the thing. People think, you know, this is about pain. She wasn't experiencing pain. She was experiencing a disconnect from her body, from her brain, and from, from, from who she really was. Um, so I share an end with Whitney's story here because she didn't get checked. She didn't get checked um, until she was 19. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. Your children can get checked and should get checked, as should your entire families. You know, everyone deserves to have their spine and nervous system optimal, you know, function in an optimal um, state so you can express your highest level of health and function. Um, so please, you know, look up, you know, look for a family chiropractor in your area, icpaforkids.org. Um, if I can help find someone, if you can't, feel free to contact my office at San Diego County Chiropractor.com. I'll be happy to help you find somebody. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to be with us today. And um, I hope that you and your family um, experience um, great health and healing um, from here on out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. That, that was a fantastic uh, presentation. I learned a lot of things myself, and I've been a pediatric chiropractor for a long time, so I really appreciate all your work that you put into this. And I'm hoping that, uh, is there a way people can reach out to you if they have specific questions that they would like answered? Yeah, they can, they can go to my Facebook page, Dr. Steve Tullius, T-U-L-L-I-U-S, um, and send me a message there. They can go to my website and send me a message there, San Diego County Chiropractor.com. And I'm happy to uh, take questions, emails, and, um, and uh, help any way I can. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Nancy. I appreciate the opportunity to share and everything you're doing to educate. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.